I'm Steve Nissen, and I'm here with uh, two extraordinary experts in valve their heart disease, Dr. Brian Griffin, who's a cardiologist, and Dr. Mark Delanoff, who's a cardiac surgeon. We're going to talk about timing for valve surgery. So let's take it one valve at a time. Uh, let's talk about the aortic valve. Um, how do you make a decision in the contemporary era when somebody is ready to have an operation? Used to be a little easier than it is now. We didn't have so many tools. We've got a lot of tools now, Brian. Maybe you can start that off. So I, I think it, it really depends on what the, what the underlying problem is. But let's start with aortic stenosis. Um, it used to be that we waited and waited and waited because uh, Results weren't that good. In fact, Jean Brunwald said many years ago that the leading cause of sudden death and aortic stenosis was unnecessary surgery. That's not true anymore. The results with surgery have gotten so much better. Results with TAVR have got so much better. And there's increasing evidence that waiting too long may, <clears throat> may lead to uh, irreversible changes in ventricular function. So I would say that our threshold to intervene still symptoms, but also looking at left ventricular function, um, not just ejection fraction, but things like strain and b natriuretic peptide. And we see, start to see that there's a blip. The strain is going down, say, below minus 16 percent. BNP is going up. That's something that I look at in terms of making a decision. If I have somebody who's younger and I'm a bit worried about that they have really severe aortic stenosis and claim they're asymptomatic, I would put them on a treadmill. And again, we've seen and we've shown that if they can't achieve their age and gender matched cohort, if they can't do as well as somebody of their age and gender in terms of exercise testing, they're at risk in long term if they don't have surgery. Surgery is, or valve replacement is quite protective over the long haul, even in people who have evidence of impaired LV function to start with. The valves gotten better, Omar? The valves are definitely better. We have two broad categories of valve replacements, and aortic stenosis is always a valve replacement, not a repair. The two broad categories are biological or bioprosthetic valves. Those tend to be cow or pig, and mechanical valves. The current generation of the biological valves is very durable. People over the age of 65 will usually get one valve and it will last more often than not last the lifetime. And the mechanical valves are good. The issue with mechanical valves is most people don't want to be on long-term anticoagulants. And they have to take warfarin. They can't take uh, you know, these newer anticoagulants. So that's a little it requires all the monitoring and so on. So Brian, does this improvement in, in valve technology, and I, I'm going to ask you a little bit later about surgical technique, but in, 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 has this had an influence on, on timing? It has. I, I think we're, um, we're, even the guidelines which tend to lag practice a little bit, but even they now suggest that it's reasonable to go ahead and intervene in aortic stenosis in somebody who has very severe aortic stenosis, if you assume that the, if the center where you're going to do the surgery or the procedure has a mortality of 1% or less, I'm happy to say that our mortality for AVR in all comers, isolated AVR, is about 0.5%. So in somebody who has critical aortic stenosis, who isn't symptomatic, it's still, it's now considered reasonable to proceed to an intervention, whereas before it was not. So I think it really has changed how we approach things. Now we didn't talk about aortic regurgitation, which is actually in some ways more interesting. And we have had some recent data that suggests that uh, the, the data that was available for the guidelines before was from the 1980s. We have looked at about 1,300 patients, which is about four or five times the magnitude of data that was previously available. And, and there is a, certainly a, a suggestion that waiting till the ventricle gets really big and dilated uh, may not be such a good thing in the current era. Uh, and again, I think we will, we're beginning to see the same thing. Uh, interventions are safer than they used to be, and waiting and waiting and waiting until you get 
these massive changes in ventricular size and function, structural changes in the heart, which may be very slow to resolve after, even after a very successful procedure. So I think that if I were to take the global picture of everything in, in valve disease, as the procedures have gotten better, mortality has gone down, we've gotten better valves, the uh, threshold to intervene uh, keeps on uh, lowering. And so, you know, uh, if you had an absolutely perfect valve, why wait, I suppose? We don't have absolutely perfect valves, but they've gotten very good. And as Mark points out, in older people, biological valves are very durable and are, are very successful. So waiting until somebody is kind of just one inch away from, from falling over the cliff may not be the way to go. And uh, the guidelines are beginning to reflect that, that viewpoint. So what are the surgical innovations that have, that have kind of moved the needle in terms of lower mortality, better outcome, shorter, I presume shorter hospital stay. What are you doing that you didn't do a decade or two decades ago? For aortic stenosis, of course, it's almost always, virtually always a valve replacement. And our techniques for cardiopulmonary bypass and the operative conduct have improved, so risk has gone down. Aortic regurgitation, though, is special. The person with aortic regurgitation needs a cardiac surgeon who is capable of repairing the valve. If the person, patient, has aortic regurgitation, the valve is not calcified, we have experts who can repair those valves, and we were talking about biological valves yes. and mechanical valves, pig valves, cow valves. What I really want is my human valve. There's no valve like your own valve. There's no valve, there's no place like home, there's no valve like your own valve. So if you've got pure aortic regurgitation or a patient with that and no calcium on the valve, you need a surgeon who has the likelihood of repairing that valve. That's your best option. So what fraction of the valves now that you're operating on, the aortic valves for aortic regurgitation, are you able to repair? Probably going to be about 20, 25 percent. So it's not, not, a, not a majority? Not a majority, but I think the majority of those that could be repaired are replaced because few surgeons have the experience and expertise to repair these valves. So let's turn for a moment then to the mitral valve, because both of you, and particularly uh, you, uh, Mark, uh, obviously spent a lot of your, a lot of your life uh, 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 fixing mitral valves. The timing considerations for mitral valve disease, uh, how have they evolved in recent years? So similarly, I would say that <clears throat> there's an increasing realization that there's a price to pay for waiting. And it, in some ways, it's more problematic with the mitral valve in that symptoms are quite late and the ventricle has remodeled, uh, often compensates very well, but there are subtle changes that are occurring at a molecular level that we don't necessarily detect with our current uh, imaging techniques. What we do, what we are beginning to see is, uh, again, that uh, some changes in left ventricular strain, uh, some changes in BNP, and we found that those are predictive of poor long-term survival, even despite surgical intervention. So waiting until bad things have started to happen may not be such a, a good idea. So I would say the simple way to, to consider mitral regurgitation is if it's a primary problem, that's myxomatous or a prolapsing valve, and the regurgitation is really severe, and it looks like the valve has a high likelihood of being repaired. And what marks kind of uh, abilities, that's in virtually everybody these days, which I'm happy to say, uh, as long as they don't have a lot of calcium on the valve, then waiting is probably, you know, is not such a good idea. Now, patients may opt to wait, but uh, there isn't a reason to hold off doing an intervention. In, <coughs> It's different though, you know, or, and maybe I'll, I'll turn this to Mark because he did uh, some of the seminal clinical trials in this area in ischemic MR, where our, how we approach uh, ischemic MR is different than it was, say, five, seven years ago, often really based on the information that Mark and his colleagues gleaned in, that, so in those well, clinical let's trials. Let's take, take well, first things first then. First of all, obviously, this, this rationale for operating earlier in part is due to the fact that you now do most of these patients minimally invasively. Uh, 
any sense of what fraction of the, I'm assuming it's isolated, you know, mitral valve mm -hmm. disease, you know, what fraction of these patients are you able to repair? Um, for isolated mitral valve disease, say prolapse, yeah. we can repair about 99% of them. Yeah. And uh, of course the goal is to get that valve back to normal. And just like with the aortic valve, your own valve is the best valve, but the mitral valve is fundamentally different because we can almost always repair the mitral valve. Um, not everyone is a candidate for a robotic or minimally invasive approach. I was approach. going to ask you that next. So who, who gets these minimally invasive robotic procedures and who doesn't? The people who are qualified for that go through an algorithm or we put them through an algorithm where we look at their CT scan, their echo, their cardiac cath, make sure that they're good candidates, meaning they don't have calcium in the valve, as you brought up. They have a valve we think we can repair. They only need a mitral valve operation. We can put them on the heart-lung machine through the femoral artery and so vein. So they have to have not so severe peripheral vascular disease. Right. Peripheral vascular disease would be a non-starter and better just to have a regular procedure. Our algorithm is very selective. It leads us to do maybe a couple hundred robotic mitral valve operations per year. But the results validate the algorithm. Our operative mortality is 1 in 2,000. Yes. And they go home quickly? Um, I, today is Friday. People I operated on Monday are on the way out today. So yeah. four days, yeah. thereabouts. Yeah, it's really come a long way. I, listen, I'm old enough to remember the era of cardiac surgery when it was quite an ordeal for patients, uh, for any valvular operation. And uh, I hate to tell you this, but I'm old enough to remember when there were a lot of Star Edwards ball, ball and socket. Those ball worked. Things. They worked, but they were they were pretty crude yeah. by comparison yeah. to, to Some now. of them are still in. Yeah. Yes. Some of them are, are, are still in. Now, let's turn to this issue that, uh, that Brian raised about ischemic MR. Tell us what the thinking in now is about what to do, when to do it, timing particularly. The surgical role in ischemic MR is likely extremely limited. If you are operating for ischemic MR, the repair is unreliable, and we would tend to favor replacement with a bioprosthesis, biological valve. Uh, but of course, the COAPT trial suggests a remarkable benefit to uh, reducing the MR with a clip. Yeah. And so do you think that's really been a game changer? Yes. Um, surgically, we recognize that these were relatively high-risk patients. Repairs, for whatever reason, were not durable. And if they can get a less invasive procedure that appears to have a surprisingly large benefit, but it's there in a randomized controlled trial, that's the way to go. Do you ever stage these things? Do you ever have somebody who has this and you, you say, okay, they're, they're kind of pretty sick right now, but I'm going to go ahead and, and, you know, and do something like a, like a mitral clip and then bring them back when they're a little bit more stable and then maybe do something more definitive? Is that, um, is that Uncommonly. Happen? Uncommonly. Yeah. Um, we had a patient uh, last weekend in the CCU, though, with mitral valve prolapse unstable yeah. and uh, recommended a clip for that. Yeah. But you might go back later and, and do something else. If necessary, yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, this has been great. Um, you know, uh, I really had a great opportunity to talk to two people who, who spend much of their waking hours thinking mm -hmm. about who to operate on, what operation to do. And you know, I have to say that I'm very proud of the fact that the as a result of the collaboration, you know, good, you know, decision making, you know, up front by the cardiologist and, and terrific surgery, we just have amazing outcomes for these patients. Yes. It's a huge advance. Uh, thank you for watching. I'm Steve Nissen for the Department of Cardiology.